Okay, let's go for this uh, uh, overview on wine analysis 30 years after the French paradox. So, in fact, what I want to show you first is uh, the world code of death. So you have here some uh, figure and some uh, number comparing, in fact, 2000 and 2019 for the World Health Organization. And you have here, uh, finally, the different categories of deaths. Uh, the first type of uh, death, in fact, uh, is ischemic heart disease. Then you can see that there is stroke. Uh, then chronic obstructive pulmonary uh, disease, lower respiratory infection, neonatal condition, trachea, bronchus, lung cancer. Seven is Alzheimer, that has increased a lot, uh, and other type of dementia, uh, diarrheal disease, uh, and then diabetes uh, mellitus, that was increasing also, kidney disease. So globally, as you see, ischemic heart disease has increased since uh, 2000. Uh, then also stroke. Uh, then also stroke and uh, Alzheimer uh, and diabetes that are uh, important uh, uh, disease also. Uh, you can see also the number of uh, deaths. Uh, so for ischemic heart disease, it's around, it's more uh, about uh, 2 million to 8.9 million deaths in 2019. Um, and uh, uh, stroke and chronic pulmonary disease also uh, uh, has increased about uh, uh, 11 and 6 percent. So it, each time you have 1 percent, 2 percent, it's a lot of thousand uh, people, in fact, that are dying, in fact. And so this figure or this number are very important uh, to, to see what is the panorama actually in the world. So uh, all the world cause of death uh, are very important, of course. And so uh, diabetes has also entered in the top 10 of the, of the type of death uh, with an increase that is very important around 70% since 2000. So that's also uh, very important. And so another point concerning Alzheimer is that the tribute is more feminine, actually. A lot of ladies, in fact, uh, are touched uh, by uh, Alzheimer. Uh, so ladies are maybe uh, uh, more sensitive uh, or maybe because they live longer. I don't know. <laughs> uh, and so this is also one point that we have to, to talk about. Um, what is important concerning the French paradox is to see what is the history. And so you can see here, since 1978, Arthur Klasky uh, was uh, working and was uh, preparing the, what we call the G-curve. But qu'est-ce qu'il fait? If you, uh, thank you, thank you. Oh, no, no, okay. Yeah, yes, yes, okay. it's okay. Voilà, so. But I need to have the full screen. Is it possible? Okay. okay. So um, you have uh, Arthur Klasky that was preparing uh, a lot of work uh, in the Kaiser Permanent in Oakland, in California. And so uh, Arthur Klasky was uh, showing the G-curve and so the, the abstinence, in fact, uh, there is people that are dying more of cardiac disease uh, in comparison with the ones that are uh, drinking a, a few glasses a day. Um, then it was in 1981, um, Jean-Louis Jean Richard, uh, François Cambien and Pierre du Cimetière that were showing in Toulouse that uh, there is a, a gradient north-south evoked concerning the death uh, for cardiac disease. Uh, and then the real vulgarization of what we call the French paradox was made uh, uh, first by Professor Serge Renaud uh, and then by uh, Kurt uh, Ellison. And it was uh, one of the famous uh, Emission the 60 minutes uh, on CBS uh, that vulgarized uh, the French paradox with Serge Renaud uh, in 1991. Uh, then it was a Danish study by Morten Grandbach uh, 
it was in 1995. Uh, and so to see that in a country like Denmark, that was not a, a, a wine producer, there is also effect for the people drinking wine. It was also a very important issue. And in 1997, we have Jean-Marc Orgogozo with uh, that show favorable effect on neurodegenerative disease um, also in, uh, in Bordeaux. So finally, there is two basic concepts uh, for the French paradox that are challenged by modern epidemiology. French people do not die less and do not eat too badly. Um, but the, the stimulating idea of Serge Renaud prime a large number of studies on complex relationships between alcohol intake and health. And so the evidence today from uh, epidemiology confirms that protection brought by moderate alcohol intake expands the area of protection behind cardiovascular disease to degenerative disease and from neurodegeneration until uh, um, to bone loss. And so uh, you have also a, a decrease of all causes uh, that can be found in a, a lot of papers that were published. You can see here, for example, one of the famous figures of the uh, consecrated to the French paradox by Serge Renaud in The Lancet in 1992, showing that the north, northern country in Europa, uh, Finland, Ireland, Sweden, Norway, Denmark, are uh, where you have a more uh, uh, mortality of cardio heart disease. And this is place where the people are drinking more uh, spirits. Uh, Intermediary, you have uh, Austria, Germany, Belgium, or the Netherlands, a uh, country where a lot of people drink spirits, but also beer. And then completely uh, on the, the, the other uh, side, uh, you have South uh, Mediterranean country with Italy, Spain, Portugal, Yugoslavia at this time, and France, uh, that is really different. Uh, that have the lower level of cardio heart disease. And this is country at this time uh, where the people drink a lot of wine, uh, more than spirits and more than beer. Uh, and so this is in comparison with the calorie uh, brought by uh, dairy fat. And you can see in fact that and the France is in red. It has a, a special position in comparison with the other countries. That's the reason that uh, it is called French paradox because the, the only explanation that Serge Renaud found uh, inside the register of uh, cardio heart disease, uh, the world war uh, cardio heart disease, was a negative correlation to explain uh, this uh, difference with the wine consumption uh, to have, in fact, this uh, red point here uh, in this figure. Alors, the story is that, in fact, atherosclerosis uh, begin with uh, lipoprotein uh, uh, low density. Uh, they can be modified, and uh, there is oxidation of this lipoprotein. And lipoprotein, in fact, uh, conduct in this case to what we call macrophage. Macrophage with the time uh, at the vessel to um, become from self. And foam cell uh, create, uh, with, there is growth factor with a metalloproteinase conducting to cellular proliferation and matrix degradation uh, for the, the, the vessel and the arteries uh, generally. Um, what is important is that at the end, with the time when we are uh, aging, all of us, we can see here fatty streak uh, ateroma, uh, for example. Then we can have also, in some case, stenosis, and you can see the reduction of the light inside the, the, the vessel, or arterial thrombosis uh, that can happen with time. Uh, this is a type, in fact, of uh, uh, things that can happen uh, when we take some age. Uh, a lot of uh, uh, epidemiological uh, studies have been done. You can see here some work from uh, Di Castelnuovo in 2002, uh, already 20 years ago, almost. And so uh, if you look all these studies, prospective study or case control studies, so uh, we can see that the average for adult, a moderate consumption of wine is associated to cardiovascular disease reduction risk about 30, 40% when you take uh, all, the, all the study. So it was already uh, uh, some things that, that we know eh? uh, at the last century. 
And so what is very important is finally that the wine is a, is a special product with a special composition where you have, of course, alcohol, but not only. Uh, you have also minerals, you have aroma, you have uh, uh, some uh, specific uh, nitrogen compounds, for example, or polysaccharide, but also phenolic compounds. And so red wine, in fact, has around uh, between 2 and 2.5 gram by liter of phenolic compounds. Uh, in comparison, dry white wine has only 400 milligram by liter. So you have a big difference between five, six, seven times in function of the type of product. And so in sweet white wine, you have a little bit more, 600, uh, around 600 milligram by liter. But so there is uh, really uh, a powerful concentration of phenolics, in fact, in red wine. And this is one of the points maybe for the superiority of red wine. Uh, what is happening when we uh, drink the wine? So uh, there is an absorption of the phenolic compounds. Depending on the form of these phenolic compounds, they can be glycosylated uh, or, of course, uh, on the aglycone form or on a polymeric form. They go through small intestines, then to the liver, and then they can go, uh, in this case, uh, in function of the treatment in the small intestine with metabolism, uh, several types of uh, metabolites can be uh, generated. So phenol acids, uh, free or in conjugated form, uh, that can be sulfate or glucuronides with or lactone derivative, for example. And so all these compounds can go through uh, tissues. And so at the end, uh, with, uh, through the kidney, there is filtration and go to urina. And you can see some of the compounds, for example, that were formally identified in some papers. Uh, so there is a real metabolism of these compounds and bacteria, but uh, some of uh, the colleagues will talk about it is a very important issue to understand what type of metabolites and what is happening uh, with uh, the metabolite. Some uh, word uh, we did with Professor Waterhouse and Professor Frankel in UC Davis uh, show, for example, uh, individual compounds or molecular compounds, especially tannins effect. You can see, for example, catechin, epicatechins that are monomer of tannins dimer of, of tannins or trimer of tannins uh, effect, in fact, to uh, um, fight against oxidation of lip uh, lipoprotein uh, low density, low density lipoproteins. And so you can see that the level in comparison with vitamin E is generally quite upper until three times uh, in comparison for same concentration. Uh, and so this was a very important issue in 1996 uh, to show, in fact, that these phenolic compounds are very powerful and more powerful than some vitamins that are supposed, in fact, to protect uh, from oxidation. So we have antioxidant defense. Some of them are enzymatic with superoxide uh, dismutase, catalase, glutathione peroxidase selenium, glutathione transferase or they can be also non-enzymatic with vitamin E, vitamin C, uh, vitamin A, carotenoids. So phenolic compounds that you have, of course, in grapes or wine, uh, then selenium and glutathione uh, that act, in fact, against uh, oxidative stress. And so in this case, that can be powerful to reduce oxidative pathology. And in fact, uh, all these compounds um, fight against lipidic peroxidation, protein oxidation, or nucleic acid alteration. Uh, a lot of work was done, and uh, for example, uh, potential polyphenol activity and arteriosclerosis it shows that most uh, muscle uh, uh, cell proliferation, it increased vasorelaxing activity, nitric oxide, uh, um, uh, mediated relaxation, it inhibits the expression of adhesion protein, it can reduce LDL and cholesterol oxidation, and it's increasing uh, plasma antioxidant activity. For uh, Alzheimer, uh, the Paquit cohort uh, uh, between 1988 and 2003 on 4,134 uh, people was a beginning. Uh, and so it was a significant, significant association between wine consumption and cognitive performance. 
And so moderate initial wine consumption was correlated to five times less risk of initial dementia at three years. And so the same relation was fine with Alzheimer's disease. So the risk of dementia uh, with significant, significant decrease uh, was found for subjects consuming more flavonoids generally. Um, it's possible that uh, some typical compounds um, uh, from the intestine transformation, especially elagitanins, can be converted, for example, in urolitin. Uh, and so these compounds can probably protect uh, neuronal uh, uh, and reduce neurotoxicity, uh, especially uh, wine is aging in uh, wood, and wood can uh, uh, generate elagitanins. And so this is a very important issue to to understand what is happening probably uh, at the brain level. And for example, we were able to show formally, uh, it was not wine, but it was pomegranate that we were using, uh, that you can have, and you can see here, here the, the peak. Uh, this is urolitin found after uh, ingestion, for example, of, uh, of, uh, of pomegranate juice. And this, uh, uh, these compounds uh, reduce uh, some uh, aging disease like uh, Parkinson's disease, um, especially in a rats model system, for example. So probably elagitanin from uh, uh, wood that are in wine can probably act the same way here. Concerning cancer, uh, a lot of things has been done. And you have here, for example, in 2013, a meta-analysis with more than 48,000 cancer deaths in 18 prospective cohort study. And it was found a G-curve. Uh, for light drinkers, they have 9% lower risk of cancer. Uh, for moderate consumers, it was no effect. And of course, for excessive uh, or heavy uh, consumer, it was increased risk of cancer by 31%. So we need really to be moderate. We did some work uh, and special uh, review. This was a few years ago uh, in 2020. Uh, and so um, in this review, we were looking about 140 papers. Uh, and so what we found finally is that epidemiological study concerning large cohort uh, uh, shows that for cancer of uh, upper aerodigestive tract, liver, colon, breast, pancreas, prostate, Excessive and or abuse consumption of alcoholic beverage is correlated with an increased uh, risk. Conversely, there is probable decrease in risk uh, for kidney uh, cancer as well as for non-Hodgkin's uh, lymphoma, thyroid lymphoma associated with moderate consumption of alcoholic beverages. And there is no evidence for ovarian, stomach, head and neck, lung cancer, and linked to moderate consumption of alcoholic beverages. Uh, Cancer is a multifactorial disease. We should remember also about this point. Uh, and there is many factors that contribute to health effect, both genetic and environmental. The habits are very important. Uh, smoking, diet, food lifestyle habits, physical activity should be also taken into account. Uh, the consumption, frequency, patterns for different types of alcoholic beverages. Is it wine, beer, spirits, or something else? Uh, and so there is insufficient data to say that moderate consumption of red wine with meal as a part of healthy lifestyle is associated with an increased risk of cancer, actually. So we know that the practice is uh, uh, potentially okay for cardio disease, diabetes, and other chronic disease, uh, and possibly uh, for certain cancer. So we should continue to explore about cancer uh, to understand uh, what is happening and to uh, register effect. Uh, last part uh, is concerning, in fact, yes, the life expectancy. Uh, in fact, I want to show you just a few slides uh, concerning, uh, finally, a large study from Harvard University that was looking about uh, lifestyle factor and life expectancy. And that's very interesting. Uh, a lot of people can live without major disease and confirm finally some recommendation. Uh, following a healthy lifestyle, in mid midlife, in fact, is associated with longer life expectancy and a lower risk of major disease like cancer, cardiovascular disease, and diabetes. 
And so there is a, a specific factor, never smoke, normal body weight, uh, the, the body mass index between 18.5 to almost 25, moderate to vigorous physical activity, moderate consumption of alcoholic beverages, women between five to 15 grams uh, a day, and men between 15 and 30 grams a day, and of course, a balanced nutritional diet. So that's an interesting uh, point. And so for some of the people until seven years, more of life uh, uh, expectancy for men uh, is of interest, uh, of course. But you can see, for example, that already in 2005, uh, 2005 some people were publishing already the, the impact of the diet. You can see here that uh, uh, 150 mil wine a day reduce cardio disease by 32%, fish four times a week, 14, fruit and vegetable, 21, Dark chocolate, 21. Daily consumption of garlic, 38. Almonds, 19%. Uh, so we, we, we still have to work with the nutrition. It's a very important issue to understand. We are here also in a country, Japan, where they have some specificity. Uh, you can see here this new concept that is called blue zones. I see that maybe some of you have heard about it. There is, in fact, five uh, places in the world, the blue zone, where people live the longest and are healthiest, generally, and where you have a lot of people that are uh, arriving 100 years old or more. Uh, you can see here there is Lomo Linda in California, Mikoya in Costa Rica, in Sardinia, Italy, in Icaria in Greece, and in Japan, Okinawa. Uh, in fact, um, a certain lifestyle uh, or version can length one lifespan. And you can see here this pyramid uh, for these uh, centenarians that have some habits in, uh, in this area, especially in Sardinia, uh, for example, they are drinking wine uh, and uh, it's Canono, that is Grenache wine, uh, that they drink uh, generally uh, with meal, uh, one, three glasses of wine a night, and so you can see this pyramid, it was say, uh, one, you need to move naturally. Know your purpose, downshift, 80% rule. It means that we should not eat more than 80%. Uh, we should not go uh, outside a meal uh, full, in fact. It's what it means, a little bit less. Uh, we should take plants land. We should have wine at five. Family should be first for everything. Uh, you need to belong, belong something, and so right tribe. Right. So, and that's a very important issue you see uh, uh, in terms of uh, of contest. Uh, you have here the same thing. Uh, how can you live uh, to the one hundred? And so you you find, of course, all the elements that uh, I I was talking about already. So finally, to finish, there is favorable change in cardio heart uh, risk factor. With wine and alcohol, there is an effect on HDL, high density lipoprotein increase, fibrinogen that decrease, factor seven decrease, thrombosis decrease, platelet aggregation. And then for polyphenol, there is a decrease of LDL oxidation, endothelial uh, function with nitric oxide by the inocentase that is increasing, DNA damage that decrease, lipid peroxide plasma that decrease, and antioxidant capacities that increase. There is specific mechanism of action of wine polyphenol on chronic pathology. You have an effect on polyphenol on free radical by trap directly, an effect of uh, uh, polyphenol on endogenous antioxidant. It is an economy, especially for vitamin E, vitamin C, beta carotene. You can have chelation by polyphenol of some metals that are oxidation cofactor for iron and copper. Uh, you can have uh, inhibition of oxidative uh, enzyme by some uh, phenol, cyclooxygenase or lipooxygenase. And so you have this effect of phenol on the enosynthesis at the cellular levels with the release of potassium uh, at the vessel uh, level. And so in this case, you create vasorelaxation and hyperpolarization. Then to conclude, uh, finally, what we can say, we can say that wine can play a nutritional preventive role integrated in diet with moderate consumption. Phenolic compounds from grapes and wine have some therapeutic interest for cardio disease and chronic disease. And so we need to continue some research 
on wine consumption effect on chronic pathology and health in the nutrition area. Yeah. And so we are here in this uh, medical center with Pasteur. And I just want to remember that uh, uh, our French uh, uh, scientist, uh, Louis Pasteur, uh, was saying that wine is the healthiest as, uh, and, and most hygienic drink. And so I want to thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you very much. I think that we can go through the next speaker. And we will have the question uh, at the end of the session. Uh, next speaker is Professor Sato. Okay, I'd like to talk about uh, radicals. A superoxide radical uh, scavenging activity of my phenolics and the topics of resveratrol. Okay. Abstract is in uh, net, so I, I omit this. Introduction, uh, a topic of health effect of wine from French paradox. Uh, that was uh, talked the first, the former pro professor. So I will explain the superoxide radical scavenging activity. I, uh, uh, the, I say SOSA of wine itself. Uh, wine itself. <laughs> We we'll explain the superoxide radical itself, and the results show the activity of increase uh, with aging period. The model wine experiment was also carried out, and the increase of malvidin three glucoside and uh, minus epicatechin connected with its bridge was shown along with the increase of the aging period, period of about five years. I'll explain the result, but by the way, wine contains this virtual and the strong anti-cancer activity was reported by Zhang et al. 1997. After the report, many research on the resveratrol have been uh, reported including antioxidant property and relation with many health properties of wine. This virtual activity makes the longevity substance such mean. Uh, recent topics of this virtual related to various uh, suppressive effects of diseases such as diabetes, longevity, and the topics of this virtual related to autophagy would be reported. Uh, at first, the SOSA of wines. The SOSA value of the wine samples were determined by using the hypoxanthin antioxidase superoxide generating system. The assay was carried out on uh, electron spin resonance, ESR spectrometer, uh, according to the method of Mitsuta et al. The detailed method was done by, by me, so <laughs> please read my paper. Uh, the result of SOSA, uh, red bar is uh, SOSA, and uh, another bar uh, shows the uh, total polyphenol. So, Cabernet Sauvignon and uh, uh, Nebbiolo is very high act uh, activity and also high uh, polyphenols. And uh, white wine and uh, rosé wine is not so uh, high. So what is important, the uh, color may be. So a relationship between color of wine only at 520 nanometer and uh, SOSA value was high and the uh, correlation value but are not so high. They are equal, equal 0.7517 by the simple regression analysis. By the simple regression analysis, the phenolic content of each of the wine samples was shown to be highly positively correlated. R is uh, 0.96886, almost one, with SOSA values. Therefore, SOSA values of wine was found to be dependent on the total uh, phenolic content. In view of the evidence presented, we postulated that consumption of red wine in moderately 
may indeed be one of the uh, several ideal ways to regulate free radical reaction uh, mediated disorders such as coronary heart disease, atherogenesis, cancer, diabetes, and aging. Uh, I selected the, the, what is important. So uh, di, uh, 12 wines was selected and uh, fractionation was done. Uh, we found the uh, C18 setback back is a very important uh, column to separate the uh, uh, phenols. A, the correlation of the total uh, polyphenol content and the SOSA before fractionation, uh, fraction A uh, was uh, R is 0.97, very high. The fraction containing sugars in organic substances without, without absorption to the cartridge is uh, fraction D is very low, uh, no correlation with SOSA. And, uh, the fraction containing catechins and uh, phenolic monomers and uh, dimers have high phenolic content. Fraction C is very high, uh, R 0.95736, but the, the uh, strong is not so high. The last one, the uh, anthocyanin dated uh, colored substance, very high and strong. Uh, so Fraction D has the uh, highest phenolic content and highest correlation with SOSA. So I thought the uh, anthocyanin is very important, but anthocyanin polymer and the tannins is also very important. As poly uh, polymerized anthocyanin would be highly important for the strong SOSA, we decided to try model wine experiment. The examination was carried out with a research group of Professor Osa Osawa, the famous uh, Nagoya University uh, professor. The model wine contained ethanol 12%, tartaric acid 0.5%, and pH 3.2. The molybdenum O glucoside 0.3 mole and minus epicatechin 2. 0.0 mmo and uh, acetohaldehyde, 35 mmo, was added in the model wine at room temperature. The chemical reactions were monitored at 520 nanometer the, uh, mm, by HPLC analysis for several days. And so I used the uh, materials, the uh, unsigning, un and uh, epicatechin and aldehyde. So na new two peaks with 520 nanometer absorption were appeared at day four and the peaks showed maximum at day nine. The peaks were separated from the mixture and the structure was determined mainly by NMR study. The structure was shown in the next slide. Um, but uh, just the uh, uh, anthocyanin and aldehyde uh, that doesn't uh, produce nothing. And also, marbidin, uh, anthocyanin, and epicatechin can produce uh, new peaks, but it, it took uh, long days. This one is uh, new peaks. The structure was marbidin 3 glucoside and minus epicatechin connected with ethyl bridge. The two peaks uh, were stereo isomers. And if the acid aldehyde was not added in the reaction, the new peaks appeared after 40 days incubation. This was the activity, uh, inhibition activity of preterite coagulation. I showed this way, I see 50 percent inhibition values. So the peak one and peak two shows very small number, needs a high activity. They are almost uh, about three times or four times higher activity than 
uh, materials more uh, understanding. Epica Techni has no activity on the emission activity of platelet coagulation. The next uh, SOSA. SOSA made uh, like this uh, uh, hypoxanthin and xanthin oxidase, like this, and uh, using uh, ESR. And uh, the IC50 value is here. So peak one and peak two is very small value. It's very high activity, almost the same level of epicardiacin. Uh, but uh, anthocyanin is not so high. So the instrument content of IC50 was three to four times lower than the reaction material. So malvagin sun, three glucoside, and epicardiacin. The SOSA value of peak one and two also smaller IC50 than the reaction materials. It means the peak one and two shows three to four times higher activity than the materials used in the reaction. And cyanide monomer, malvagin or glucoside, made new substance connected with uh, epicatechin with H bridge and showed high SOSA and high inhibition of platelet. Uh, coagulation. Aging of red wine found to make a uh, highly active substances. Therefore, we examine the polymeriz polymerization reaction using various vintage of mineral wines. Uh, this time, I was stayed in the Milsham Cooperation. <laughs> so I uh, gathered uh, uh, good mineral wine, Kikyongahara mineral from 1985 to 1998 was corrected. And signing in wine were fractionated with M4 uh, extraction disk in 1999. The fractions were analyzed, the total polyphenol content and DPPH2 to DPPH1 uh, picture radical scavenging, scavenging activity. I showed that PRSA, the, uh, PRSA was measured with the HPLC method. The unsigning fractions were treated with a GPC column, the separate uh, molecular weight uh, by the toy power HWF. The elution pattern was shown. The G, as the GPC was done in 1999, late appearing peaks, late appearing peaks is a uh, monomer. Uh, monomer and signing may disappear. Uh, so in 1996 vintage, it almost uh, disappeared. So about three years, uh, the monomer disappear and make a polymer. The PRSA per total polyphenol was calculated and its uh, relation is each, each year was shown in next next slide. Uh, this one shows, uh, figure five shows the relations of PRSA per total polyphenol with, with the wine vintage. The figure shows the PRSA of 1998 to 1994 uh, very uh, linearly in, <laughs> increased the activity. And so PRSA increased for about five years with the increase of aging almost linearly. The taste of red wine increased smoothness that it's uh, becoming a uh, good, good, good taste, five years or more vintage, and the activity of polyphenol uh, also increased for about five years. However, however, however uh, this wine is also uh, made in each year, so uh, it's uh, not, not so the same condition. So uh, this, one, this one is... Uh, I would be needed in the correlation of vintage and PRSA more research. But uh, uh, the activity is increased by the aging. Uh, next, uh, I'd like to talk about resveratrol. Resveratrol is a silicon silicon compound that is found by a Japanese uh, Takaoka. Uh, in Hokkaido University in 1939, very old. And uh, this one is an uh, active uh, form. And if we are uh, uh, as a uh, light, 
after it to change the conformation cyst. Resveratrol we found from toxic plant, veratrol uh, grandiflorum, but our resveratrol is not toxic. Resveratrol has not corrected attention for long years. So in 1976, Rankake and the Price found it was a phytoalexin. Our uh, resveratrol was found from grape in 1988. Crazy and co coffee. Uh, found it from grape skins. In 1992, resveratrol was found from wine, and uh, resveratrol is rich in the grape skins of Pinot Noir because uh, Pinot Noir has a very thin uh, skin, so uh, resveratrol is an uh, antifungal activity, so uh, Pinot Noir has a high level of uh, resveratrol. Uh, as there was a TV program to frame paradox, you know, Luno, there are many studies on functions of red wines were carried out, and anti cancer activity of resveratrol was found by Jan uh, Pezzetto in 1997. Uh, there is a longevity substance in uh, animal cells, uh, and it was called sartuin. Sartuin is uh, NAD plus dependent histone the acetylase. The searching was found by Professor Leonardo Garanti in MIT as a SR32 silent information regulator in the East in 1999. The histone is an alkaline protein to bind with DNA. DNA is the acidic. So searching deacylase uh, histone. So, the histone increases the alkaline property, alkalinity. So the de de deacetylated histone binds stronger to DNA. The DNA bond with deacetylated histone increases the stability. So it means the uh, longevity. The very stable DNA becomes very stable. In 2003, the report uh, respiratory elongated lifespan of the East appeared, and uh, in 2004, respiratory activated such in metazoans, and in uh, 2005, respiratory activated such in C. elegans. And uh, early 2006, respiratory prolonged lifespan related the onset of age-related markers in a short-lived vertebrate. And in 2006, this virtual improved health and survival of mice on a high calorie diet. The mice report shows that the high calorie diet shortened the lifespan, but if this virtual added to the high calorie diet, the lifetime became almost at the same level as the standard diet. So this virtual simulated the mice searching and the lifetime was increased. It uh, became a boom of respiratory supplements in the United States. Recently, respiratory is collecting attention related to autophagy. FAC uh, reported that respiratory induces autophagy by directly inhibiting the uh, MTOR, MTOR ULK1 pathway. They found that inhibition of MTOR, MTOR activity and presence of uh, ULK1 were required for autophagy in the induction by this virtual. Recent review uh, focused that autophagy regulation by this virtual. The regulation is related to the prevention and treatment of cancer. Oh, that there is a human intervention studies of this virtual uh, tumors is a study 11 obese men and uh, 11 health, healthy men for 30 days are this virtual use chemically synthesized one uh this beta 150 milligram per day and the placebo were administered for 30 days by 
the chromosome method. This viral activated NTK in muscle and increases SAT1 and PGC1 alpha in protein. This viral reduces the inflammation markers, lipid content in liver and blood pressure, uh, blood glucose level, and so on. The effects were similar to the calorie restriction effect in the mice. My talk is that uh, I hope. Thank you very much for your attention. I hope you can enjoy staying in Japan and please enjoy Japanese food, sake, wine, and also Japanese culture. Thank you very much. So good morning. Um, I'm Dai Hirata from Sakeology Center, Niigata University. And first of all, I appreciate organizing such a wonderful international meeting. And this weather is, season is very nice in Kyoto. So I'm, I'd like to thank also uh, organizer and everyone involved to, for giving me this opportunity to speak at the International ONB to Symposium 2023. Today, I'd like to talk about the theme, East is a model organisms for human health. In Japan, it is said that sake is the best of all medicine. Uh, by Japanese. <laughs> so, moderate drinking is good for your health. As you know well, it is difficult to stop drinking moderately sometimes. So, this slide shows the sake brewing method. The sake, uh, raw materials of sake are water and rice. Rice starch is hydrolyzed by the enzyme amylase, which produced by koji mold. And this step called saccharification. The produced glucose is converted to alcohol by biochemical reactions of yeast. So in sake brewing, saccharification and alcohol fermentation proceed simultaneously. This method is very unique for sake production. So finally, sake mash separate into sake and sake leaves. And many uh, bioactive components have been identified in sake li and sake, sake. And here are some examples, some health benefits uh, identified in sake and sake leaves. Ferric acid which has an uh, antioxidant activity, and the HLD glycoside, which has a beautiful skin effect, are uh, identified in sake and sake leaves. Already, antioxidant, the importance of antioxidant activity is mentioned by the Professor Tesodore and Professor Sato. So, Today, I'd like to talk about focus on the yeast rather than the bioactive components in sake and sake leaves. So I'd like to discuss the basic yeast research for human health and longevity. This is the content of my talk today. At first, I introduce how yeast became the model organisms of humans. After that, I introduce our yeast research results for healthy longevity. In the late 1960s, Dr. Hartwell started to isolate CDC mutant, cell, cell division cycle mutant, which arrest at a specific phase at the cell cycle. And he showed that the genetic map of cell cycle progression. And he concluded that the cell, cell cycle progression was regulated, is regulated by genes. So, so oh. And Dr. Pornas introduced to the Hartwell's budding East cell cycle research into fission yeast. 
And he found, he discovered the uh, protein kinase CDC2 kinase, uh, which is a key molecule of cell cycle progression. And further, he uh, demonstrated in 1987, he showed yeast CDC2 and human CDK1 are functionally interchangeable. So this report established the yeast as model organisms of humans. So further, uh, yeast research revealed the checkpoint mechanism, which is important for the maintenance of genome integrity. And this slide shows us a chromosome structure, which is similar to yeast and human. Kinetic are necessary for separation of sister chromosomes, and telomeres are necessary for the maintaining the chromosome structure. And mitotic spindle elongated from centrosome and captured kinetic core, and then separated to the opposite cell pole. This shows the sister chromosome segregation, as you can see. Sister chromosomes are separated synchronously. Furthermore, East studies discovered spindle assembly checkpoint SAC, which is important for maintenance of chromosomal integrity. In wild type cells, in normal cells, kinetic core of sister chromosomes captured by spindle elongating from both uh, proteus uh, centrosome. This is called bipolar attachment. I, after bipolar attachment are established, and then sister chromosomes separate to the opposite pole. However, monopolar attachment occurs where only one spindle captures kinetic core. If so, this happens, there is a mechanism, metaphase arrest, inducing metaphase arrest. And after bipolar attachment are established, and then chromosome, uh, sister chromosome separate. This uh, mechanism inducing metaphase arrest, we called spindle assembly checkpoint. This is SAC. So however, in BAB1 mutant, BAB1 mutant, uh, meta monopolar attachment occurs, but this mutant lack metaphase arrest defect and then entered mitosis. And finally, causing the abnormality such as non-disjunction of sister chromosome and the production of any ploy. So BAB1 mutant shows a Benomil sensitive phenotype. Sensitive phenotype. Benomil is microtube polymerization inhibitors. So East BAB1 controls mitotic checkpoint and chromosome segregation in East. On the other hand, this slide shows the phenotype of CIN, CIN, chromosomal instability in cancer cells. Left is a normal chromosome in normal cells, and the right is uh, cancer cells. As you know well, as you, you, as you can see, uh, abnormalities such as the number of chromosome and intertranslocation of chromosome are observed in cancer cells. But this same phenotype, the cause of cause was uh, unknown. The cause of this uh, same phenotype was unknown. In 1998, the East Bab 1 homologue genes in cancer cells was identified the causative mutation of same phenotype. So this report established the analysis of East checkpoint mechanism became the central issue for elucidating human cell carcinogenesis. genesis. Dr. Hartwell and Dr. Paul Nassan and Dr. Hunt were awarded the Nobel Prize in Physiology of Medicine in 2001 by the East research just I talked about. So I'd like to introduce next uh, topic.
our uh, institute uh, is research for healthy longevity. At first, I show uh, I introduced the breeding of healthy yeast with normal checkpoint integrity. Sake yeast strain K1801 has been used widely for uh, daigin joshu in Japan. Daigin joshu is a highly high quality sake. In the, in the case of daigin joshu, the highly polished rice with uh, rising polishing ratio of 50% or less are uh, used because out of rice contains a lot of proteins and uh, unfat uh, unsaturated fatty acid, which cause the unpleasant taste in final product of sake. So sake is the strain K8001. This strain was isolated as a serulanin resistant mutant. Serulanin is a a fatty acid in a synthesis inhibitor and produce the high level of ethyl caproate, which is one of the major ginjo flavors. However, at the brewing site, the properties of this strain are sometimes unstable, and it has been pointed out that there is a problem with the stability of sake quality. So therefore, we searched for the function, SAC function, spindle assembly checkpoint function of this strain. And surprisingly, we found that this strain shows a venomid sensitive phenotype. Means a lack defect of, in SAC function, spindle assembly checkpoint function. In order to find the responsive mutation of SAC defect. And we searched for the responsive mutation. And National Research Institute of Brewing has the general database of sake yeast. And we collaborated with the National Institute, uh, Research Institute of uh, Brewing, uh, Dr. Akao, and collaborate with Akao, and then we uh, searched for uh, a mutation site. And at first, we examined the checkpoint function of sake yeast strain, these kind of sake yeast strain. And we found that K13 strain also showed venomid sensitive phenotype, means a uh, spindle assembly checkpoint defect phenotype. So we searched for the same, uh, same mutation of 15 SAC related genes in both K801 and K13. And we found that uh, responsive mutation, the CDC55 R48 fluorine is, uh, this mutation is responsive mutation for SAC defect. CDC55 is a uh, protein phosphatase 2A regularly subunit and is important for SAC function. So this mutation site is conserved uh, in, is located in this evolutionary conserved region of CDC55. So we and I try to isolate CDC55 wild strain with normal checkpoint integrity from K801 strain. So next, I'd like to talk about the search for the genes related to healthy longevity. So far, we have analyzed the uh, uh, calcium signal pathway in budding yeast. And we found that the calcium signal pathway is involved in novel checkpoint in budding yeast and fission yeast. Top is our result of uh, budding yeast and uh, uh, bottom is uh, our result of fission yeast. Both yeast, calcium signal pathway is involved in a novel checkpoint pathway. And further, we found that calcium signal pathway is involved in replicative lifespan regulation. And the subsequent analysis, we found that S adenosyl methionine, SAM, this accumulation, some accumulation extend lifespan of yeast. So as you know well, uh, 
S-adenosyl methionine is synthesized from methionine and ATP, and accumulate, accumulation of some leads to the decrease uh, in ATP level, and then activate AMP activated kinase, and then induce longevity. So the effect of some for these disease depletion, osteoarthritis, and liver disease. This effect is already published uh, by other groups. So some accumulate at the late stage of alcohol fermentation, and the sake leaves contains a lot of some. So several health benefits of some uh, sake leaves may be explained by the accumulation of some. As you know well, this slide shows the lifespan control pathway induced by calorie restriction. Already mentioned the former professor are uh, conserved, evolutionarily conserved from yeast to human. We hope to isolate a novel longevity control genes and we direct like to contribute the word. Uh, alcohol, sake is the best of all medicines by ease research. So see, I, I directly finally, uh, I, I finally introduced my collaborators. And this uh, uh, research started in 1994 at the Imperial Cancer Research Fund, London, now Francis Crick Institute, headed by Dr. Pornas. And then we conducted checkpoint analysis at Hiroshima University. And I'd like to thank the previous collaborator, uh, Labo staff, Dr. Mizunuma and Dr. Kume. They became already a professor and assistant associate professor. And also I thank them, Dr. Akao and Goshima and National Research Institute of Brewing and Dr. Shimoi, Brewing Society of Japan and Oya in Tokyo University. And since 2020, I moved to uh, Niigata University. I have conducting uh, East research at the Sakeology Center at Niigata University. And um, I direct, finally, I direct to thank the Dr. Ikuhisa Nishida. He is sitting here and photo, photo me, take photo, photograph me. So, so that's all. Thank you very much for your attention. Hello, my name is Andrea Botezato. I'm an associate professor and extension enology specialist with Texas A&M, Texas AgriLife Extension Services. And I am very excited to be here today and to share some of the research that we do in Texas wine research. Um, since I'm extension, we do a lot of um, applied research projects. And today I'm gonna to talk about one of those. Um, it uh, involves the use of Verjou as a possible wine acidifier. And I'm going to start with um, a little bit about verjou, what it is, the definition. It's the sour juice made from unripe green grapes that have been has been consumed since the medieval era for culinary as well as health um, related purposes. Um, in different countries, it is known under different names. So we have a list of names there um, that uh, can be used instead of verjou, depending on where you're from. So because it's produced from underripe fruit, um, green grapes basically, it is um, the acidity is high in verjou. Um, it has lower sugar concentration, a sour and tart taste. It's a good source of antioxidants, phenolics, flavonoids, and anthocyanins, depending on the type of grape that you're using. Um, and its chemical makeup includes phenolic acids, sugars, organic acids, calcium, magnesium, potassium, and sterols. Um, traditionally and historically, verjou has had many uses. It's had culinary uses. Um, it's been used as a cooking ingredient since medieval times, actually, in various parts of the world. 
Um, it's commonly used as a substitute for vinegar or lemon juice um, in dressings, salad dressings and sauces. Um, it can be used as a marinade, um, you know, addition to marinades and dressings. Um, it's also used as very popular nowadays in the preparation of various cocktails. So it's a it's a cocktail darling, really. Medicinal uses um, has several health benefits, as we will see a little bit later in the presentation. Um, it has been recognized in traditional traditional medicine. It's believed to add digestion, also reduce swelling and pain. It has antioxidant properties, and um, also it uh, it has been shown to have cardioprotective properties as well. It's also used in cos cosmetics um, as um, it is um, an astringent, so it helps to, with tightening of the skin and the appearance of pores. It also is, has been used in hair care products. Um, it helps with the pH of the scalp. Other uses, um, it can be used as a natural cleaner or disinfectant, but in our case, the question was, can it be used as an acidifier? And I'm gonna do a little detour here and show you where we are located geographically. That's Texas over there, again here. So if you look at this parallel here, you can see that Texas is, is really a Southern, very Southern states within the United States. And we're on the same parallel with Morocco, Algeria, Libya, Tunisia, and Egypt. Um, if we go a little bit further North, I don't know where the pointer disappeared, but if we go further North here, or we're kind of um, on the same parallel with uh, southern Spain and Greece. So, thank you. So, um, it's hot in Texas. The weather is very warm. The nights don't get very cool. Um, so, for that reason, we have issues with acidity. Uh, malic acid gets um, uh, metabolized because of the heat. So we have low acidity in our grapes coming in. Low acidity means high pH. High pH means a lot of possible issues, microbiological instability issues, color issues, tannin issues. So pH is a big problem in Texas. This is um, a result of a survey that we're running actually um, as I speak. So this these results are from May 1st, a week ago. And one of the questions in our survey is, what is your most important winemaking wine quality problem? This survey has been sent to all the wineries uh, and grape growers in Texas, and 52% of them say that pH um, is their most important wine quality issue. So pH is a um, focus of our research um, in our team at Texas A&M Enology Lab. So again, the question was, can we use Verjou as an acidifier? Can a lot of grape growers uh, practice crop thinning to improve the quality of their grapes. So when you crop thin, you drop uh, a portion of your uh, harvest before the grapes ripen. Usually those grapes are considered the waste product and not just left um, on the ground, so not used for anything else. However, um, we know that we can press green grapes. We know we know that we can obtain uh, verjou from them. So can we use that verjou as an acidifying option uh, for wines made in Texas? And then if we can, how would that impact the quality of the wines and the sensory profile of the wines that we um, added verjou to, um, to acidify? Also, another question that we had, is it economically feasible to use verjou as an acidifier or to have it as a standalone product for your winery? So just produce verjou and sell it as verjou rather than an acidifier. As I mentioned, harvesting for verjou coincides with cluster thinning. Um, usually somewhere it happens somewhere between bunch closure and veraison. And this is a herbaceous growth, growth phase where the berries are small, green, and hard. Again, low sugar concentration and high acid concentration. So this was our action plan. Um, I don't know if you can see in this picture, but that's my student, Andrew, cluster thinning the grapes to get the underripe grapes and make the verjou. And Andrew's sitting right there. So say hello, Andrew, to that same over there. So this was the action plan, cluster thinning the grapes, destem, press, um, obtain the fresh juice, then let it settle for a little bit, rack it, store it at five degrees Celsius. And then we ran chemical analyses on the juice itself. Then we blended, so we had our proper trial, the acidity enhancement trial here, 
So blend our verjus that we produced with the juice of um, ripe grapes. So we waited, we picked ripe grapes, and then we blended the verjus with the juice from the ripe grapes, ferment together, and then again, run chemical analysis and sensory analysis. And finally, it turned out that we had a lot more verjus than we anticipated and then we than we needed for our trials. We weren't sure how much we will get. We weren't sure about the yield um, at that point. So we picked quite a, a little, a few uh, green grapes. So we ended up with extra verjus, which we bottled as a standalone product. And you can see the little bottle here. That's a 375 ml bottle. Um, that's the same process only in pictures. So how did we set up the trial? Again, we had the controls. So these, this was done in duplicate, the controls. Uh, these were ripe grapes picked at full ripeness um, and their starting pH um, of that juice was 3.56. Then we had treatment one uh, where we uh, targeted um, a pH of 3.3. So we added verjou until we reached this pH of 3.3. That was our target pH. And then the second treatment, treatment two, was adding uh, verjus to the juice to have a 0.1 pH drop. So how much do, do we need to add to drop the pH by 0.1? Uh, we're trying to run a comparison with tartaric acid, which is traditionally used in um, the industry to acidify uh, wines. So we know that usually one gram of acid addition, you know, generally speaking, drops the pH by 0.1. So we wanted to compare, see. How does Verjou compare? So these are the technical specs for um, our experiment. The Verjou was, the grapes were picked on July 7th of 2022. Um, we thinned three, 372 vines, dropped eight clusters per vine for a total weight of 186 kilograms of green grapes, which yielded 97 liters of um, ju juice. And then after racking, um, we ended up with 80 liters. That's a 43% yield from the green grapes. Um, as compared to the ripe grapes, the ripe grapes were picked in on August 5th, 2022, and harvested the same number of vines for a total weight of 277 kilograms with a yield of 129 liters pre-racking and 83 liters post-racking. And the variety that we used was a Muscat Canelli, so like white grapes. This was the chemistry of the green juice. Um, so we picked up, um, we harvested the green grapes 45 days post bloom. That's, and that's the chemistry there. We had 9.4 bricks in our verjus. 2.6 was the pH of the green juice. Titratable acidity, 27.3. Malic acid, 16.7 grams per liter. And tartaric acid, 9.6 grams per liter. Pre-fermentation blending results. So um, again, we had the control and then treatment one where we targeted a 3.3 pH and treatment two where we targeted a 0.1 pH drop. So for the control, the, the bricks were 23.9 and the alcohol potential calculated from that was 14.1. For treatment one, you can see um, a bricks decreased to 22.4 by adding the verjou, the, the bricks decreased. And then the potential alcohol also decreased, um, obviously. And then for treatment to a smaller decrease in bricks and um, also a, a lighter potential decrease in alcohol. And then post-fermentation, we did the same measurements after we fermented the wines. And um, the control, uh, that was the original control. And then the actual alcohol was 14.3, 13.2, and 14. One. And if we look at the acid profiles of the blending treatments, this is the acid profile of the control with a pH starting pH of 3.6, titratable acidity of 4.1, malic acid 1.3, tartaric 4.1. And this is our treatment one. So the target pH was reached at 3.3. Titratable acidity increased to 7.1. That's a significant difference right there. Malic acid increased as well. Um, the tartaric acid only a little bit of, um, of an increase we see there. And for treatment two, a little bit of a pH drop, the 0.1 that we were targeting, increase in titratable acidity, 
a little bit of an increase in malic acid and um, tartaric acid as well. Post-fermentation blending results. Um, so that was pre-fermentation, what we just saw. This is post-fermentation and um, the pH is held pretty steady there, uh, which that's what we were mainly interested in. Um, tartar, um, titratable acidity, same pattern, the highest being in treatment one, which had the biggest addition of Verju and the highest pH drop. So that was our chemistry. So basically what our chemistry told us is, yes, you can drop the pH. You can lower the pH of the wine by adding green grape juice, which logically makes sense. Um, it worked. Um, it was stable post-fermentation. And now the question was, okay, but how does it affect the quality of the wine, the sensory profile of the wine? Um, are they bitter? Are they too sour? Are they off in any way? So uh, what we did, we had... Um, three different sensory rankings so we had three industry tastings for the first one we had 58 participants the second had 80 participants and the third 31 participants for a total of 169 total and we presented the control plus um, two treatments to them um, lines the samples were coded and they were presented in a randomized order and we asked them to rank the samples in order of preference with one being most preferred and three being least preferred. And these are the ranking results for tasting one, tasting two and tasting three, and then the overall ranking with all the three tastings put together. So really there's no difference in the preference of the tasters between the control and the um, treatments. There's a slight difference, nothing was significantly um, different in these tastings. So basically rated the same for ranking. So that what that tells us is that the addition of the Verjou did not affect in any negative way the quality of the wines that were produced with the addition of Verjou. So same rankings there. And then moving on to the Verjou economics um, side, we looked at it from different perspectives. We looked at it. So in Texas, we have grape growers, we have wineries, and then have wineries that are growing grapes as well. I assume that's the case um, everywhere. So looking from different perspectives, how how um, you know how much it costs to produce the verjou and use it as an acidifying agent, does it make sense economically? So this is from the vineyard perspective, all the work that you have to put in to harvest the green grapes, you know, um, cluster thin harvest um, and transport the, the, the harvested grapes. And it turned out that um, you would generate about 2.5 tons per acre of green grapes. That's a lot, but some varieties in Texas um, are very vigorous and produce um, high tonnage, um, some varieties such as Tonat, for example. So with that in mind, that was the variety used in the model. 2.5 tons per acre, the price, the cost, what you would have to recover is $316.90 per ton to get your money back for all the work that you put in to, to gather all these grapes. So if you were to do that as a vineyard, you would have to sell your green grapes for at least $317 per ton to recover the money that you put into all, all this work <clears throat> to harvest them. And then on the winery side, you're a winery, you want to buy the green grapes from grape growers. Um, in Texas, again, we, we're a huge state, so a lot of the grapes get transported by trucks. So transportation is a big part of the costs that we have there. So transportation, bringing them in into the winery, all the equipment used, the time involved, the labor involved, all that is um, in that table there. So total cost were $1,300 for 100 gallons of um, wine, which is about 380 liters of wine, 100 gallons. What that means is that the cost per liter of Verjou produced is about three and a half dollars per liter. Now, it took us about 10% 
0.1 liter of verjus add, added to one liter of wine, of regular juice, to drop the acidity by 0 0.25 points, pH points. And that means, if we make the transformation, that it costs us about 35 cents per liter of wine to acidify with verjus. Now, if we look at tartaric acid for the same type of addition, if we are to add um, 2.5 grams of tartaric acid per liter of wine, that would cost us 0 0.02 cents per liter, a lot cheaper to add tartaric acid than verjus. However, with verjus, if you remember, we add about 10% by volume, and that means that we are increasing the volume, the final volume of wine by 10%, which means we have 10% more wine to sell. And if we sell, if in that calculation, that um, comes out to around 500 bottles, sold at a price of $13 per bottle, um, average kind of, actually that's on the lower side for Texas. That would bring in an additional revenue of um, $6,698. So that would make sense economically to, to do that. And, and then if um, you make Verjou as a standalone product for to sell on its own, not as a, not used as a grape wine acidifier, the break-even price per bottle turns out to be about $5. So that's what it costs, including the bottle price. So we see just to produce it was about $3, but including the bottle price, labels, caps, and all of that, it goes up to five, um, um, $5 per bottle. Um, what do we know about how much other people charge for Verju? These are some prices that I was able to find out online. So... These are all Verjou bottles that are being commercially sold right now. Um, and th those are the prices that they are selling for. So the, the lowest price I found was $14 per bottle. The highest was $30 per bottle. Um, at a cost of $5 per bottle for the winery, then they can make a good profit selling this product as a standalone product. And remember, these are these are waste. Th at least in the United States, grape, green grapes that are cluster thin are considered waste. So why not use them? Why not? It's, it's a sustainability approach as well, right? Why not use them to um, generate more income and also acidify your wines if they, if they work and if they don't affect them negatively? And finally, talking about health benefits, we heard a lot about the health, health benefits of uh, wines in general today. Um, they hold for Verjou as well. These are all studies that have been performed on, with Verjou, using Verjou in different models. Some of them were rats, some of them were rabbits, and some of them were human. Um, how, the conclusion is that um, it has antioxidant activities. It's a immu immunomodulatory product. So all these positive health effects um, that it has have, have been demonstrated. And this is just what the data that I was able to get before coming here, looking at polyphenols in our verju. So that's our sample of Muscat Canelli. Um, so the total, total polyphenol content was 194 milligrams per liter, which is not necessarily very high for grapes. Um, but this is um, a white grape. We are going to work with red grapes this summer. So we're going to run these analyses again and see how they compare. But anyways, they're better than tartaric acid. So you're you're adding these to your to your wines. When you add tartaric acid, you just add tartaric acid. So clearly a positive impact from a health perspective. And the conclusions are that yes, verjus can be produced from cluster thinning grapes, that it is effective at lowering pH and increasing wine acidity, that it leads to a decrease in, alco in alcohol levels in wine. And that that's, can be a positive because we're seeing such increases in sugar concentration uh, with a warming up of the climate in general. So higher alcohol levels, as we all know, they're not necessarily better. So sometimes a decrease in alcohol can be a positive. And this is what Verjou does. Um, and it does not negatively impact the sensory profile of the wine. And from an economic perspective, we saw that it made sense from all uh, approaches, be it a vineyard winery or vineyard and winery, you can make a profit. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you very much. We continue. So the next session now is beginning.
Uh, first speaker is uh, Dr. Eva Fernandez from the University of Porto. Uh, and so she is talking about view availability yeah. for uh, phenolics compounds, metabolism and microbiota interaction. That is a very important issue. So Eva, you have the, the floor for the next talk. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So, uh, thank you. I will first of all uh, thank for the invitation. It is a it is a pleasure to be to be here today with you. I'm going to talk about wine polyphenols, as Pierre Louis uh, already said, um, and some specially and very controversial issues that are bioavailability, metabolism, and also microbiota interactions. So, as you all know, Mediterranean diet recommends the high consumption of fresh, fresh vegetables, fruits, also fish, eggs, and, and, and poultry over red meat, obviously, and the consumption also of olive oil. Based and supported by recent research uh, recent research projects like Monica Project and also PediMed study, also uh, the Mediterranean diet is recommending the consumption of moderate wine as a part of a health diet and also uh, lifestyle associated with protective effects against relevant chronic diseases. In fact, we know that wine has been part of a, culture, a human culture and also has served many dietary and social religious functions since a long years before uh, Christ. But as we have been talking in the last session, there is some problems associated, associated with wine and not only ethanol, but other contaminants, biogenic amines, pesticides, and also sulfites. So the main problem is obviously ethanol because there are some reports that even from from the minimum alcohol intakes can lead to health concerns so in terms of health effects for be 100% sure that there is no problem we have in fact to think about the removal or the uh, reduction of wine uh, of uh, ethanol in wine so what should be the anatomy of a bottle of the alkalized wine in fact we should remove alcohol and how does it get we still get a lot of bioactives a lot of health components. So we have minerals, vitamins, sugars, proteins, and you may be asking, what else? What else may contribute for the benefits of red wine? And that will be the focus, especially the focus of my topic. So what are the contents of phenolic uh, compounds in wine? We have already heard about this today. So we have different contents in, in the case of a white or a red wine. And obviously the main difference relies on the flavonoid contents that will give a much high phenolic content for the, the red wines. And as you can see, we can get more than one gram of flavonoids per liter, a content that is much higher than other uh, sources of fruits or vegetables. And so let's look inside these structures and try to see what we can get. So in terms of monomeric structures, we will have flavonols, anthocyanins, hydroxycinamic and hydroxybenzoic acids, also obviously stilbens and flavanthriols. And these are only small examples of the uh, diversity of structures that we can get in, uh, in terms of monomeric um, components. But you we also have, and we also heard some uh, comments on this today, we also have polymeric structures on wine that are very, very important. So we have proanthocyanidins, hydrolyzable tannins, and we also can have polymeric anthocyanins. And what are, in fact, the contribution of these components to the health benefits is also something that we have to clarify. And because wine is much more than grape juice, we have fermentation occurring. And fermentation step is very important because during this, we can transform anthocyanins into a cocktail of different structures. We normally call them pyranoanthocyanins because they have here an extra D ring. So these structures can have different colors, as you see, and also have a higher 
stability to pH variations, to oxidation and to temperature and light exposure. And we can have also a second generation of pigments that, the, that are derived from the spirano and the cyanins and the reaction with other phenolics that are present in wine, some of which can be extracted during oak aging. And this is a, a very uh, important process of the interaction of phenolics with what we can generally call yeast metabolites. So we can use uh, acetylacetic acid, we can use pyruvic acid, acetylate, to perform this type of new structures. So how should we understand the effect of this wine complexity cocktail of molecules? We can get one uh, approach that is the pharmacological approach. We have numerous in vivo and in vitro studies looking at the individual activity of molecules. These are, obvi these are obviously very important, but we have to think that when we do this type of assays, we, we get the activity of a special molecule at a specific concentration. And normally when we try to translate this to human uh, situation, we can get news like this, that will be great if it was possible and it, if it was true, but in fact, it's not equal to drink a glass of wine or to be one hour at the gym. So we have to take care in the, the approach that we follow to understand the bioactivity of wine. So when we look at this, should this really be true, we, we have to understand that the amounts used in that uh, animal assay corresponds in fact to a very huge amount of resveratrol that will be equal to drink 225 liters of wine. So mm -hmm. this is obviously not possible. So what should be the best way to understand the effects of wine? We should obviously test the effect of the old polyphenol fraction and especially inside wine matrix because the old wine matrix will have a huge and important effect. But when we look at what happens after ingestion of wine, we have liver metabolism, gut microbiota, we have a very important problem, a very low plasma concentrations of the main polyphenol structures. So should we have in fact effectiveness considering the very low range of uh, concentrations that we have detected? This is our main question that we all want to see answered. So to answer this, we will start together the wine journey. So starting at the oral cavity, what can happen? So during the short time that polyphenols, wine polyphenols can stay in the oral cavity, different complexes can be formed with salivary proteins. So this will obviously affect the availability of these polyphenols for digestion. We can inter, this will, polyphenols can interact with amylase, so it will reduce carbohydrate digestion. And also we can have interaction with oral microbiota enzymes. So this will have obviously an increase in the biosensibility of some polyphenols. And obviously, as you all know, when you try a wine, you have some sensory pro properties like astringency and bitterness. Follow oral cavity, we'll get to the stomach. Normally, the stomach is not much considered in terms of absorption bioavailability issues, Although we have demonstrated that in stomach due to low pH, we have an increase in biosensibility of polyphenols, and we can also have some gastric absorption and metabolization. We have recently uh, performed this um, in vitro study in which we have studied the absorption of anthocyanins and also a red wine extract, and also of some, some flavonoids and different uh, complexity of procyanidins. And as you can see here, they are all able to be absorbed at the gastric level. In terms of the specific case of anthocyanins having a glucose in their structure, we were able to see that glucose transporters are involved in their absorption, in their active absorption. We can also think about the inhibition of some digestive enzymes in, in the gastric compartment that could obviously be, be involved and related to the control of some uh, diseases. So to prove you that this is not just in vitro, 
we have performed uh, uh, human trials with the uh, volunteers in which we have um, offered to our volunteers red wine and also port uh, wine with a high uh, sugar level. And we have uh, followed the pharmacokinetic activity of uh, anthocyanins during two hour period. So in the first hour period, and almost after 15 minutes, we can get already anthocyanins in plasma. And more than that, if you look at the dotted line here, we can get metabolized anthocyanins 15 minutes after injection. So it is obviously that we can get metabolization in gastric compartment, the one that we didn't consider until now. And we can later on obviously rely on intestine and hepatic metabolism. You can see here dotted line. So these are anthocyanin conjugates, the main and the most important one not the anthocyanins that were present in the original beverage. So we can here in this slide resume how does the, our cells uh, contact with anthocyanins and how they transform them. So we can have cirrhosis cutting the aliphatic part of acylated anthocyanins. We can have also here, uh, the glucose being cut by the uh, cytosolic glucosidases, and then we can have UGT transforming them into glucuronic, glucuronic metabolites. And we have proved that it's in fact in the same position as glucose was. So this is uh, great how human be how human body can in fact metabolize these compounds. So after the stomach, we can get to the intestine, and we know that about 5 to 10 percent of the total phenolics ingested are absorbed in this compartment. We can have here the conjugation, because we already have some microbiota here present, and we can also have the removal of gluco glucose in the species that, that have uh, glucose in their uh, structure, and we can have two types of mechanism of absorption in the intestine, by passive diffusion or by active transport involving SGLT1 or GLUT2 uh, um, transporters. So uh, the, the fraction that is not, uh, that is absorbed here in the intestine will uh, continue that journey. Just to highlight that Although we have normally uh, monomeric structures being absorbed, we also have already proved that dimeric structures like procyanidin B3 and also uh, chimeric structures like catechin malvidin dimers are also to be absorbed, are also possible to be absorbed in the intestine. So the fraction that is an absorbed gets in fact into the system. Regulation. So, so we can see that in liver, we will get glucuronides, sulfates, and methylates forms of flavanthriols, anthocyanins, and flavanols. These are the types of metabolites that we can detect in plasma and the urine samples. Obviously, that in terms of uh, urine, we will get also phenolic compounds that can be uh, found conjugated in different positions with the same type of groups that I have already referred. When we get to the colon, we get to around 90 to 95% of the total polyphenols um, that were ingested are getting here to the colon. And we have here a two-way relationship. So we can get microbiolic catabolism that will go that will result in phenolic metabolism and will obviously have a great prebiotic effect, but we can have the other side also. So the phenolics that are produced here can have a positive modulation on the microbial uh, environment. So we will see examples of this two-way relationship. So getting into the first topic, how are microbiota and uh, bacteria able to catabolize phenolics, we can have here an example of what happens to catechins and oligomeric proanthocyanidins. So we have uh, several points, several types of reactions that could occur after C-ring opening. So this first step, we can have the formation of this type of uh, compounds that will be derived from Borrero 
valerolactone or valeric acids. And then we can have the carboxylation, the hydroxylation and oxidation reactions. Most important than look at the uh, structures themselves is for you to understand that although these two compounds are exclusive from the catabolism of flavantriols, we have others that are common with the catabolism of phenolic acids. So we have here common structures between between different classes of uh, phenolics. When we have uh, um, flavantriols conjugated with galoyl groups, we should have the action of sterases that are present in our microbiota, the release of gallic acid, and then the carboxylation and giving result to pyrogalol groups. In terms of the anthocyanins, the bacteria will cleave anthocyanins also opening this ring B. So this is one of the reactions that will occur. And then we have a similar profile as the one we have observed for flavantriols. As you can see here, you have uh, much structures that are similar to the ones presented before. And we have fluoroglucin aldehyde produced from here from ring B of anthocyanins. In the case of flavonols, they also share common um, pathways to the phenolic acid catabolism. So in these uh, uh, different classes that I show, we can see that we have similar intermediates and end products, although we can see in individuals a very high inter-individual variability. We have also classes, including elagitanins and stilbens, as we will see, in which we can stratify our population into, into different metabotypes. So we have different gut microbial ecologies that will hit specific phenolic metabolites. So as you can see here in this example, we have volunteers with gut dysbiosis and with no gut dysbiosis, so healthy ones, and both are able to produce uh, the different, both have representative the different phenotypes. So phenotype A, B, and phenotype zero. So when we have elagitanins being uh, releasing elagic acid, so the phenotype A is able to produce only this metabolite. But in case of phenotype A, B, we have more than one type of metabolite. And phenotype zero, no metabolites uh, produce it. This is also true for stilbens because we can, in fact, divide the population into the ones that are only to produce, able to produce dihydroresveratrol, so the main microbial metabolite of resveratrol, and we have the others that are able to produce different um, structures. So this is quite interesting, but more than this, we are, are able to uh, see that besides wine phenolics, the, one, the ones that are in fact, in the initial drink, we have microbial derived metabolites. This is also true. We have already seen that. But more than that, one is able to modulate, to change the human endogenous metabolites. And this is much more important because we are able to change some nutrition, nutrition pathways. And this is a very important point. In, term, in terms of prebiotic effect, Phenolic compounds may produce, produced by gut bacteria, may in fact modulate uh, for colonic for, uh, populations in terms of prebiotic effect, but also in terms of, of antimicrobial activities. So as you can see here in this picture, we have a positive effect here for beneficial microbiota and a negative effect here uh, in, the, in the harmful ones. And this will obviously have a relation to health. You can have here an example of our modulation of gut microbiota in patients with metabolic syndrome can in fact revert or improve the metabolic syndrome markers and contribute, contribute to improve obesity or diseases related to obesity. We know that wine is more than uh, is a fermented, fermented beverage. So we can have probiotics and also postbiotics present in the wine. And so we can have live organisms and also inanimate microbial cells or microbial cell fragment structures or even their metabolites. And this is very important because we already have references in the literature of malolactic species present in wine found in human feces. So this is the proof that wine can have 
probiotic properties and can contribute, in fact, to protect our health. For instance, we can have this uh, probiotic uh, uh, bacteria adhering to our epithelial cells and impeding other pathogenic uh, bacteria to um, adhere there. So what we need to know is what is the role of all this in uh, human health. And just to take home message, we have in terms of uh, phenolic, we can have wine having a directed effect. So we have wine polyphenols, the ones present in wine. We have metabolites and catabolites, the ones that will take much longer times, higher concentrations, and the more relevant physiological structures. But we have also exogenous metabolites present in wine and resulting from its met met metabolism. This is the direct effect, what can get to the circulation. But we have also an indirect effect. So everything that is also in wine concerning positive Biotics, prebiotics, and probiotics, all this can in fact modulate our gut. And you may be asking, how do they reach the different targets? They don't need to reach the different targets. They just need to modulate human endogenous mediators so we can get gut to all other organs access effect. So by this approach, we can in fact improve our health, but we need obviously scientific proofs of this. And just to finish, I come from Porto in Portugal at the University of Porto from Food Penal Lab uh, Research Group. And I would like to see you uh, in, uh, I, I hope, a few uh, years, I don't know, uh, in Porto and to appreciate with us a glass of our lovely port wine. Thank you. Okay, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm great pleasure to speak about the recent papers, especially focus on the uh, Kyoto area, longevity area data. Uh, from now, I will teach you five Food is necessary for you to promote healthy longevity. Uh, the northern part of Kyoto prefectures. Uh, we just started the cohort study in 2017, so just five years data of these areas. Okay, 20 years ago, I uh, attended the wine meeting at uh, held at Chile. Uh, I talk about the atherosclerosis and the wine polyphenols. And I enjoy the uh, Chile wine and with Professor Gunos. Uh, it's made very, very uh, fantastic uh, conference. Uh, just uh, 45 years old. <laughs> I'm 40 years old. Now I'm 65 years old. Okay, today I have four questions. Uh, one is the uh, do residents of Kyotango have a long and uh, healthy life? Second question is uh, what biomarker predict chronological age recently compared to calendar age? Chronological age is very important to judge, to measure the um, longevity or healthy longevity. And this, Third question is uh, what gut microbiota is associated with frailty? Today, I will focus on frailty. And finally, is there a link between gut microbiota and the diets? Okay, today, in this area, we gathered, we accumulated the, about 800 elderly subjects aged 65 and over who participated in the Kyotan multi-purpose cohort studies. We measured 2,000 biological markers, including hormones, CT scans, sarcopenia frame related data, and also microbiota. And we gathered dietary intake assessed by the DDH questionnaires today. I'll talk about these March on its data. DDHQ is a brief type self-administered diet history questionnaires 
body assessment of dietary index. It's very important to analyze the food factors, to analyze alcohol, or to analyze wine, or to analyze the sake. Okay, this is the first question. Do residents of Kyotang live a long and healthy life? Kyotang City, this is the located northern part of Kyoto. Oh, I introduced one important information. Expo 2025 will be held at Osaka. This is Kyoto and northern part of Kyotango. I'm an advisor of Osaka Papillion of Expo 2025. So Osaka Papillion's theme is the reborn, rejuvenation is a big theme in this Expo 2025. Our leader is Professor Matt Robert. He is a professor of uh, cardiac disease. We just, this study just started in oh, 2017. Mih is 73 years old. Mean of BMI to 23%. And systolic blood pressure means 163, and diastolic blood pressure 77. Very healthy group in this area. I summarize the data of diabetes, vascular aging, dementia data measured by MMCs, and the data uh, sarcopenias measured by grip strengths. I'm showing this slide, just 1.8% is diagnosed suspicious of diabetes. Very low incidence of diabetes in this area. In addition, dementia, dementia is just 5% seven, seven, in this older persons. It's also low incidence. And also sarcopenium is 71%, very low incidence, these subjects more than six years old. Sorry, it's a very busy slide. We calculate the modified frailty index by 14 parameters. This parameter include living activities, daily life, or overall health, psych psychological status, or complicated disease, or physical abilities. I'm showing this slide. This is a result of the about 800 subjects. More than 0.21 is diagnosed as brain. Just 55% is diagnosed as brain. It's also very low instance of frail in these older persons. First answer is of the 798 subjects, just one eight percent had diabetes, 33 percent had atherosclerosis, seven five percent had dementia, 70 sarcopenia, and just 50 percent is. Okay, next question is uh, what biomarker predict chronological age? Recently, we clearly divided chronological age and biological age. This slide shows the characteristic factors of faster pace of aging. That is very important data. About two years, follow, 20 years follow up. Most important factor to predict, uh, predict aging. Slower gait speed enhance your aging. Weaker grip strengths enhance your aging. This two factor is very important to keep your healthy longevity. 
obesity, no factor to predict healthy aging. Muscular factor to inhibit sarcopenia is important to promote healthy aging. In, in addition, these several factors also affect the this pace of aging. You know, aging clock. Recently, several aging clock is reported. Therefore, we analyze the these many data to predict aging. Several candidates with correlation efficiency more than 0.2 with calculates. Among them, grip strength and health longevity is many reported support. Grip strength is a good candidate to analyze biological aging. Five kilogram increase in absolute grip strength was associated with reduced risk of all cause dementia, Alzheimer disease, and vascular dementia. Lower grip strength is associated with higher incidence of dementia mortality from all causes. And also there is strong evidence from meta-analysis association between decreased grip strength and the increased mortality risk of all cause cancer and cardiovascular disease. This very interesting data from our Kyotano areas. This is grip strength. Grip strength negatively correlate with age. And leg extension also negatively correlate with age. Leg flexion also negatively correlates. Walking speed also negatively correlates. And freight index also positively correlates with aging. Grip strength, leg extensions, walking speed, this marker is very important to predict health longevity. I'll show you this slide. This age, grip strength in female and males. This is 70 years old, 80 years old, 90 years old. Gradually decrease in grip strength. However, this level is very, very high because the 18 is a diagnosed as frail, as so, diagnosed as sarcopenia. So among the more than 90% of these groups has a higher grip strength in female and also males. This has shown the frail index and chronological age, ages. Between these parameters, clearly positive association was shown. In our data, this is a very busy slide, but the very important biomarkers correlate with chronological ages. Grip strengths, hearing loss, leg extensions, flexions, muscular aging, Working speed, freight index. This parameter is very important to predict chronological ages. In addition, we analyze the microbiomes by the random forest methods. Because the, we have so many microbiome in the gas. Finally, we determine the three important 
microbiomes. One is anaerostips, second, rosebrias, sun branches. These three microbiome can produce short fatty acid, especially butyrate, butyric acid bacteria. These higher population of these three microbiome predict health longevity in our Kyotang studies. Okay, these are answers. Grip strengths, hearing abilities, leg muscle strengths, walking speed, quality score, which acid producing bacteria were extracted as predictors of chronological age. Third question, what gut microbiome is associated with macrophages? We analyzed the association between microbiome population and frailties. This slide shows the diversities. This, this is Shannon diversities, Shawan diversities, observed species. There are no correlation between diversity and chronological ages. This is this slide, experiment correlation analysis. This is the top certified microbiomes. This is a biomarker of the muscle functions and frailties. This range of frailty index. Okay, I pick up the frailty index. Frailty index positively correlate with these bacteria. These bacteria belong to proteobacteria and also enterobacteria families. These bacteria positively correlate frailty index. However, this blue range is important to reduce or inhibit frays. I'll show you this slide. This bacteria was negatively correlated with frailty index. Bifidobacterium is very important microbiome in especially in Japanese populations and also fecalibacterium. This is also important bacteria to produce butyric acid. Brachia also important. These bacteria can produce short chain fatty acid, especially butyrates. This is a sound answer. Plant index positively correlate with enterobacteria families and negatively correlate with short chain fatty acid producing bacteria. Okay, finally, I'll teach you fat food is important to enhance healthy longevity. The very easy slide. It's a upper first portion. This is a frame index. Total proteins, no correlations. Animal proteins, no co correlations. Vegetable proteins, no correlation with frailty index. Total fat, animal fat, vegetable fat, carbohydrates, no correlation with frailty index. Fat food is important for us. I introduced Japanese food, <laughs> not, made, not made Italian food, because the uh, Japanese groups, Japanese diets had a low risk of death from all cause cardiovascular disease and heart disease. And also Japanese diet index, JDI 9, 12, reverse JDI 12 is associated with gut bacteria and dementia. And also, this is very important. Japanese diets, rather than Mediterranean diets for prevention of salvo failures in Japanese. For us, Japanese diets may be important compared to Mediterranean diets. 
This is a scores of 12 components revised Japanese diet index and JDI trends. Coffee is a very, very nice. Green tea is also nice, but red meats, red meat minus 0.1. We, we calculate the Japanese diet index, but very, very weak, very weak association between inflated index and JDI index. In brain groups, JDI 12 statistically lowers JDI index, but not so enough to explain these data. Okay, frailty index negatively correlate with JDI 12. But fat, fat food is most important. This is a JDI index foods. That, that means the important variable for age predictions. Blue lens is a short-chain fatty acid bacteria. Okay, this range, that spot is significant correlation. This range means the beans, beans. For us, for Japanese persons, beans is very important to inhibit the freight index. I also do not take pork or beef, red meat is also important for us. Finally, I introduced the alcohol drinking habit in Kyotang areas. I'm sorry, just 10% drink wines. In these areas, Riku in Japanese shochu, Riku drink 5%. And beers, also sake, whiskey, low, 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 low instance. Sorry. Uh, also, the, I'm very interested in the frailty index and wine drinking. I'm sorry, no correlation between frailty index and wine drinking. <laughs> However, one of very interesting data is whiskey drinking. Whiskey drinking. Positively correlate butyrate producing bacteria. I don't know the why mechanism. I don't know. Okay, finally, uh, fat food is important. There is a negative correlation between the freight index and Japanese diet. And the analysis of the correlation with gut microbiome suggests increasing beans intake and restricting mean and harm is important for us. Of course, this is a many limitation. This is a cross-sectional study limited to elderly people in one region. And so this is a information about area with the relatively long and healthy lives. And that microbiology information at genus level is also limited. Finally, I should say thanks for many members, our rebels and the collaboration with the medical teams and microbiome teams. Thank you very much for your kind attentions. We've had some fantastic talks this morning and um, it's very difficult to know where I can add in. In fact, I think what I'm going to say is really going to be a summary for you of everything you've heard today. And I'm trying to put it neatly, um, as neatly as I can, um, trying to talk about the relationship where we've come from, the effects of pre-existing factors, the alcohol component, the wine component, but also a mountain pattern of consumption. And that's becoming increasingly important. Now you would have seen or be familiar with some of these slides from this morning from Pierre Louis um, talking about why is wine and health important? Because we know that it is associated with many of the chronic and major causes of disease and death, not just in Japan, not just in France or Australia, but worldwide. So we've got the J-shaped curve. 1990 was the first classical curve, but we can go back to Arthur Klatsky in 1964. 
Now, I'm very sorry to say that Arthur died at the age of 93 on the 30th of April this year, but his work was seminal with respect to cardiovascular disease and alcohol consumption and the J-shaped curve. And it was delightful, not so many years later, but to see it come up again very neatly put that you get the J-shaped curve with coronary heart disease. You get a small dip for cancer. Unfortunately, you don't get a dip for accidents. Well, if actually, if you look at the um, car accident driving, there is a slight dip right at the very beginning, but we think that's an anomaly. But you do see a lovely J-shaped curve when you take into account all these other causes of death from death from all causes. Dietary pattern, as we've heard about today, is very important. And this is from the seven um, studies or seven country study from 1999. Um, we've got Finland, the Netherlands and the US. We've got Crete, Croatia, Greece and Italy were the initial seven. And you can see here, looking at all food scores, that we see here that the higher Mediterranean diet versus the um, fattier, less healthy diet of Finland, the Netherlands and the USA had a, a distinct effect on cardiovascular disease. But as you'll notice here, Japan has been included in this, although the diet is slightly different with respect to um, fruits and vegetables. We see here that they too are and we've heard it backs up what has been said very nicely going back. We've always known that these countries have had um, longevity associated with them and re reduced risk of death from cardiovascular disease in particular. And here, when we put Spain into the mix, this was an interesting one. We knew that Finland, the Netherlands and the US drank more beer and spirits than wine. And we knew that apart from Japan, Crete, Croatia, Greece, and Italy drank more wine. Spain drinks wine and beer. It's interesting to see where their population fell. A high per capita wine consumption, it fell very neatly into this group at the most reduced risk. However, when it was a low per capita wine consumption region of Spain, and I think that's predominantly northern, you see here that it falls intermittently between the Finland, the Netherlands and the US beer drinking predominantly and spirits um, and that of the wine drinking areas. Now, there were 12 key studies. I'm not going to test you on this, as I would say to my students, but just to say that there were quite a few coming out um, from different countries. It was so nice to see that it just wasn't one country that was showing all these effects. But what was important was including wine or fish, wine, Mediterranean diet style, which included wine, lowers risk, lowers blood pressure, includes wine, and lowers cardiovascular disease. They were all very, very consistent in their conclusions. This is one of Arthur's papers from 1998. Excuse me for being so familiar and calling him Arthur, but I considered him a friend. Um, he looked at wine, spirits and beer um, and the number of deaths drinking uh, more than once per month, which is important because that's where pattern comes in. All causes he saw that wine consumers had a slightly further reduced risk well, a much more reduced risk compared to spirit and beer drinkers. The same for cardiovascular, non-cardiovascular diseases, all cardiovascular diseases, coronary heart disease and cancer. But yes, all causes, most definitely, it was the wine drinkers. And here we can see um, from Carraro in 2004, um, we're looking at the amount that was most um, associated with the reduced risk and moderate consumption at that stage. And I think pretty much still is today when we look at all the data that has come out in the last 30 or more years, that 20 grams of alcohol per day is probably optimum. 
but when you go up 72 or 80, you start to increase school risk of cardiovascular disease in, um, in particular, remembering that cardiovascular disease is the leading cause of death and disability in the world. But we've also seen that apart from ischemic stroke, high blood pressure and high um, balanced cholesterol associated with the cardiovascular disease, of which there's a 30% decrease associated with one to two drinks of alcohol um, per day. This is compared with lifelong abstainers. There was a very big issue in the early 2000s and mid 2000s that a lot of the J-shaped curve data was incorrect because it compared with people that had stopped drinking because they were considered to uh, have stopped drinking because of ill health related to alcohol consumption. When everyone who was able to looked at their data and recalculated, there was still a J-shaped curve this time compared with lifelong abstainers, those people that had never had alcohol at all. And this is shown very nicely. Oops. Uh, very nicely here. Another paper from um, Arthur Klatsky and one of his colleagues who were able to um, redo their calculations, showing that for never ex-drinkers, occasional drinkers, more than one per day, one to two per day, three to per, five per day, and six per day, then you've got your J-shaped curve. This is looking at death within 10 or more years, and this is looking at cardiovascular and non-cardiovascular users. But importantly, never drinkers here had a high mortality rate compared to those that drank moderately. And here again, this is where pattern starts to come in uh, with amount. Later studies, however, started to look at age, smoking, um, history of diabetes, and was stratified by sex. And this is coming from uh, Ramon Ostrush's uh, Pre-Med study. And it was interesting. You can see here the control diet, which was relatively low fat. Um, I believe that was one of the primary things being low fat, but here it was more the Mediterranean diet with nuts and with eggs, um, which also included wine. But you can see here a significant difference in the incidence of cardiovascular complications. In fact, after five years, they found they had to stop the study because the difference with the diet was significantly different and disadvantaged those on the control diet. And I think that says quite a lot. Um, this is one of the more recent papers from Wood et al. in 2018. Now, the Wood et al. paper didn't actually say this in their conclusions that there was a J-shaped curve. In fact, their conclusions in the front of their paper failed to show this particular graph, which was found only in the supplementary information that still shows a J-shaped curve adjusting for age, smoking, history of diabetes, and stratified by sex in Epic Center. And you can see here, this is a very, very nice, sharp J-shaped curve. Here they argued that cancer had more of an effect, but again, there is still a J-shaped curve. But I think it is very unfortunate that politically now we are seeing some papers fail to accurately report all their data in their conclusions. And here, looking again, all cardiovascular disease, diseases, uh, deaths, and all-cause mortality. Again, you can see, look, it's clear, never drinkers, ex-drinkers compared to moderate drinkers. Again, as I said, we had to go looking for that particular figure, but it's very, very clear. And this was a very, very large recent study by Woods on grants for alcohol per week, which really falls into um, the um, one to two standard drinks per day. And here again, the frequency of drinking that more less more than less than two days per uh, per week, 
versus more than two days per week. So frequency of drinking is important and it comes down to the reg regularity of drinking moderately, regularly over a period of time. We think that's related to the phenolic compounds, um, the fact that we are able to keep the phenolic compound uh, levels in the blood uh, at a reg regularly, <clears throat> start again, at a reasonably regular amount. And also the same for the alcohol content because alcohol does pay a, approximately a 75% um, role in the reduced risk of cardiovascular diseases in particular. But, here. but binge drinking, this was a pattern that was definitely not associated with a reduced risk, in fact, increased risk. Um, this is an interesting one, uh, a very recent one by Liao et al, showing unfortunately uh, regular drinking but with smoking for men was associated with um, a, re a reduced risk for regular drinkers and, and modest drinkers where the alcohol component that would normally be associated with reduced risk is shown here that that reduced risk is partially removed. Mechanisms of action, we're looking here at the initial test tube studies and that people said, well, that was all well and good. You can show that in the test tube uh, and in vitro study, but what can you show in, in vivo animal models and in particular in human clinical studies because we can't always translate animal studies directly to the results of human clinical studies. So the science, blood cholesterol, blood clotting, blood flow, and endothelial function are particularly related as beneficial effects from wine consumption. And we can show here that the effects of blood, this is again a, a summary slide. You all have seen this start this morning already, but I'm just reiterating the effect on the blood itself with respect in particular to cholesterol parameters, but also on the cardiovascular coronary vessels with respect to vasodilation, coronary flow, inflammation, which is key as we find out, atherosclerosis, and with respect to diabetes. This is um, more of a summary slide looking at phenolic compounds and alcohol components to show that they are complementary. They have similar effects. In fact, some have the same effects, but they are additive in the, their actual effects that you see. So they're both important. Both have slightly different roles um, and additive effects. Um, we can see here, just this is an interesting one. This is um, Eric Rim from the Harvard Medical School. He said here that you get a 16% reduction in co um, cardiovascular risk when you look at the cholesterol factors. Um, here, when you look at blood clotting factors. And again, here with respect to blood clotting factors, um, with um, also not just blood clotting, um, but um, the um, breaking down of a ready form blood clots. And this is quite a busy shot, a slide, but I think it shows quite nicely um, what Pierre-Louis has already shown today with respect to um, cells. And where the phenolic compounds have a play. So a summary of mechanisms of actions for moderate wine consumption, and I have to reiterate, it is moderate wine consumption. You've got your coagulation and, and platelet uh, function. You've got antioxidant effects, anti-inflammatory effects, endothelial function effects, which is, are specific to the phenolic compounds, lipid effects, effects on glucose mechanism, where the endpoints are a decreased risk of cardiovascular mortality, and all cause mortality. Um, this is um, also showing the extent of the um, different alcoholic beverages on the different risk factors. You can see here 
uh, we've got red wine, beer and spirits, but you can see that there are differential effects between beer, um, red wine and spirits, where sometimes they have the same effect, but there can be differential effects. They can be positive, but more positive. Um, and I think I'd like to conclude with this slide. Trying to put everything, and again, I'd like to thank all the speakers. It's, it's been terrific. It's been good for me to have, um, to learn what's happening out there uh, since I am not as active in the research side now. But looking here, how important we are when we look at the world projections of mortality and causes of death for 2030, you know, ischemic heart disease is still going to be the primary cause of death. And we know that wine, beer, spirits and sake have a positive effect in reducing the school risk. With stroke, with diabetes, interestingly enough, alcohol consumption is not associated with the risk of trachea, bronchus and lung cancers. That's something that's little put out there. We know that it has a positive effect for hypertensive heart disease. We know that it is not particularly associated with all cancers, but with some cancers. We know that it has a positive effect with Alzheimer's disease and other dementias. And we know that that is increasing. And breast cancer is an interesting one. Uh, that came up this morning and there was a paper published only about a month ago uh, that I have just um, seen on my desk. Haven't properly evaluated it yet, but it appeared that there are so many confounders that apart from moderate consumption, uh, more than moderate consumption, it would be very hard to say what else would be causing um, an increased risk or whether um, alcohol or of any form would increase the risk of breast cancer above moderation. Um, and I think what is probably one of the takeaway lines from the paper that I've been able to glean to date is that it is more interesting to look at risk of breast cancer after you've had breast cancer and whether you continue to drink. But wait for the ISFA review. Thank you very much.